From the Maroons to Marcus, a historical development by Seiko Tafari. Introduction by W. W. Hislop. Introduction To understand Marcus Mosiah Garvey, it is extremely important to study the mood, behavior, development, and prejudices of the people of the time. The time was the beginning of the 20th century. Slavery had only come to an end in 1834. In the United States, the Africans were struggling in every area of economic and social endeavors in their search for an identity. The names of many Africans who had fought for the emancipation from slavery were remembered only by those who were brave and intelligent enough to announce the achievements of these heroes. The West Indies were the properties of various European powers and the African citizens were regarded as a means of production. It was not difficult therefore for any African to dislike the system which governed his life, for the atrocious and inhuman treatment that were experienced were commonplace. Then too, any such race of people who has had their destiny set by another race of people must have developed a feeling of inferiority complex and vice versa. The legislation in many of the British territories favored Europeans and this was not so only in the West Indies but anywhere where Africans were the labor power. The situation in Jamaica, the birthplace of Garvey, was one where few persons voiced their disapproval of the system. History shows many savage treatments that blacks suffered under in their efforts to bring attention to the authorities concerning the inequalities in the system. People became afraid to voice their feelings. As religious associations were guaranteed under the British and American constitutions, the Africans formed churches in which they gathered in large groups to pray and express their disappointments. Many Africans became members by their oratory. Many earned the position of leaders and championed the causes of others. Marcus Mosiah Garvey appeared as an African who had been born and educated in Jamaica. He grew up in a world where Africans were denied their basic human rights and, as Garvey puts it, they did not have a place of their own. His travels to the United States brought him face to face with racial discrimination. This, he believed, was partly owing to the fact that blacks were too scattered in the diaspora. To alleviate the problem, Garvey organized the Back to Africa movement, and with the help of his newspaper, he sent the call out to all Africans. His concept was opposed by other Africans but when his organization became universal, many changed their opinions about his views. The thought and opinions of Marcus Mosiah Garvey must not be left dormant. His contribution awoke in millions of people a consciousness and gave them a purpose to live. The teaching of his works is of paramount importance nowadays. Students must not, however, try to live in the past but used the movement, methods, and dedication of Mosiah Garvey to give them strength in their struggles to bring about a more humane society for the good of all. Wilbur W. Hislop, Belmont Junior Secretary, Social Studies The Right Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey You have Africa you are in other continents and the islands of the sea. You are millions upon millions strong. I appeal to you, stop being the underdogs and footstools of others. Stop complaining, whining, and talking about bad luck and misfortune. Shake yourself. Get up. Start over. Overcome the ills around you. You are responsible for what you are, what you want to be blame no one but yourself you have the chance what you want is the will to do and to dare others to stop you this is my hope for you 
and this is the fear others have for you. This is why they watch you so carefully, that you may not get away with any progressive ideas which would be a surprise to the world of theirs. Marcus Mosiah Garvey, 1887-1940 Jamaica, Early Colonial History Jamaica, or Yamaica, as the Amerindians Indians used to call it, is about 11,424 square kilometers in size. Columbus arrived in Jamaica in 1494. He called the island Santiago, but it has maintained its original Indian name, Jamaica. Jamaica, as the other Caribbean islands, was also a slave colony. Slavery started in Jamaica as early as 1517, when the first Africans were brought there by the Spanish colonialists from Angola, although the Spanish had taken control of the island since 1509. The slaves who followed came from West African countries such as Ghana, Nigeria, and the Ivory Coast. The British under Cromwell In 1655, Oliver Cromwell was ruling Britain, and he sent in his troops under Admirals Venables and Penn to invade the island. The British troops consisted of mercenaries, regular soldiers, privateers, and the pirates. The British troops fought a fierce battle against the islands, then colonists, the Spaniards. It took the British force five years before the Spanish resistance ended in 1660. The Emergence of the Maroons After the invasion, the Spaniards abandoned their slaves. Some of these slaves then migrated into the hilly eastern mountainous region and into the cockpit country where they organized themselves into a tribal community for cultural and spiritual purposes and also for defending themselves against attacks by the colonists. The Maroons From around 1662 the runaway or escaped slaves were called Maroons. The Maroons became well known for raiding slave plantations and freeing slaves while encouraging them to join their independent settlement. The Maroons were brave African men, women, and children who loved and upheld freedom more than anything else in the world. These escaped slaves or freedom fighters never saw Jamaica as their home, but in fact always saw their homeland as Africa that vast rich continent from where they were forcibly removed. In the cockpit country the Maroons practiced their own tribal customs similar to what were practiced in Africa. Their settlements were collectively organized around chiefs and they continued their various spiritual and cultural ceremonial beliefs uninterrupted. Example, they sang tribal songs and played the drums. The Maroons were fearless fighters and they never forgave the colonialists for introducing them to that brutal and barbaric institution called slavery. Kujo, the Mountain Lion One of the most famous Maroons was a man called Kujo. Kujo was also called by the Elias the Mountain Lion. Kujo was born in 1678. He had escaped after the British had quelled a slave revolt in 1690. On escaping, he joined the ranks of the runaway slaves. He later became the war chief of the Maroons. Abolishment of Slavery Slavery was officially abolished in Jamaica and other English-controlled Caribbean islands on August 1, 1834, but due to the apprenticeship period, which was between four and seven years, most slaves really became free men and women in 1838. 
the birth of Garvey. On the 17th of August, 1887, a beautiful young African man-child was born in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica. This young man was named Marcus Mosiah Garvey. His father, whose name was also Marcus, was a stonemason by trade and a strong descendant of the Maroon tribesmen. Garvey's Early Years Garvey's education was average. He didn't attend secondary school, but had access to a vast amount of reading materials from his father's library, and later from his printing tutor, Mr. Burroughs, from whom he learned the printing trade. When young Marcus was only 15 years old, he left for Kingston. After a few years in Kingston, Garvey became involved in the art of journalism. He used journalism as a form to express the problems of the poor black man and to educate and inform the people about world issues. He published his first newspaper, Garvey's Watchman, sometime around 1910. Trade Unionist when Marcus was 20 years old, he led a printer's strike in a Kingston printery, P.A. Benjamin Printery, where he worked as a foreman printer. When his co-workers at the printery formed the Printers Union and elected to go on strike, young Marcus had already joined the union, and they selected him as strike leader. This was an unusual position for it's always expected that foremen will take the side of the employers. Young Marcus contradicted that custom and was fired. From Garvey's early experiences in Kingston, he became known around Jamaica as a social worker, a preacher of the poor and dispossessed, and a spokesman for the black working class in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Garvey and Costa Rica in 1910, Garvey left Jamaica for Costa Rica. In Costa Rica, he met a maternal uncle who obtained a job for him on one of the United Fruit Company sugar cane plantations as a timekeeper. Garvey didn't stay with that job too long. He later obtained work at Port Limon, a Caribbean seaport where many West Indians lived. Some time later, he started a newspaper, which he called La Nación, The Nation. This newspaper was used as a medium to organize the West Indian immigrants. The Costa Rica authorities didn't take this too kindly and started showing Marcus hostility. He later left Costa Rica and traveled to other Central American countries, such as Nicaragua, Guatemala, Panama, Chile, Ecuador, and Peru. Garvey's Arrival in Britain In 1912, Garvey arrived in England. In England, he obtained employment on the docks in seaport cities such as London, Liverpool, and Hull. He later traveled to other European countries such as France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Austria, and Hungary. In Europe, Marcus didn't publish any newspapers, but he wrote for black journals and attended lectures in law at Birkbeck College in London. UNIA founded. On July 14, 1914, Garvey arrived in Jamaica after a long tour which had taken him through Central America and Europe. Five days later, on July 19, 1914, Marcus Mosiah Garvey founded the largest independent black organization the world has ever known or seen, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA. Garvey became the first president general of the UNIA. Garvey built the UNIA so that it became the mouthpiece of black men, women, and children the world over. 
the UNIA, had branches in every Caribbean island in Trinidad and Tobago. It said that Garvey had one of the largest following. There were at least 30 UNIA chapters in that island, for the Trinidad Working Men's Association was affiliated to the UNIA. Garvey's U.S. Departure In the year 1916, Garvey left Jamaica for the United States of America on a lecture tour. In the USA, Garvey began organizing meetings and preaching to the black community. Negro World Newspaper Founded Garvey started a newspaper in 1918 which he called the Negro World. The motto of this newspaper was derived from Garvey's black nationalist cry, One God, One Aim, One Destiny. The Black Star Line The year 1919 was a most significant year for Garvey and the UNIA. This was so because in 1919 the Black Star Line, a steamship company, was formed by Garvey's UNIA as a means of linking the black peoples living outside Africa with Africa. Garvey held a vision that Africa was the rightful place for all Africans to live. Hence he advocated Africa for the Africans, those at home, those abroad. The first ship which was acquired was called Yarmouth, but it was later renamed the Frederick Douglass in honor of the 19th century black American leader. The second ship was acquired in April 1920 and it was called Shadyside. The third ship was called Kenawa and it was renamed Antonio Maceo after a Cuban black general who fought for Cuba's independence. The UNIA International Convention In 1920 Marcus Garvey convened the first international convention of the UNIA in New York City. At this convention, tens of thousands of the UNIA followers and members marched through the streets of Harlem in colorful uniforms. Behind their spiritual leader, philosopher, and prophet, the invincible Marcus Mosiah Garvey. In a major session of this convention held in Madison Square Garden, he was quoted as saying that, We are the descendants of a people determined to suffer no longer. The UNIA Anthem International The anthem of the UNIA International was, Ethiopia, thou land of our fathers, thou land where the gods love to be. As storm cloud at night suddenly gathers, our armies come rushing to thee. We must in the fight be victorious when sounds are thrust outward to gleam. For us the victory be glorious when led by the red, black, and green. Chorus Advance, advance to victory, let Africa be free. Advance to meet the foe with the might of the red, black, and the green. Ethiopia, the tyrants falling, who smote thee upon thy knees, and thy children are lustily calling from over the distant seas. Jehovah, the Great One, has heard us, has noted our sighs and our tears. With the spirit of love he has stirred us, to be one through the coming years. Chorus Advance, advance, etc. O Jehovah, thou God of the ages, grant unto our sons that lead the wisdom thou gave to thy sages when Israel was sore in need. Thy voice through the dim past has spoken. 
Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hand, by thee shall all fetters be broken, and heavens bless our dear father land. Chorus, advance, advance, etc. The UNIA flag. The colors of the UNIA flag were red, black, and green. Other UNIA conventions. The UNIA held a total of eight conventions. Two of these conventions took place in Kingston, Jamaica in 1929 and 1934. Five were held in the USA in 1920, 21, 22, 24, 26, and the final one was held in Toronto, Canada in 1938. UNIA and the League of Nations The League of Nations was the international organization which preceded the United Nations. The League of Nations was set up in 1919 right after the end of World War I, 1914 to 1918. The UNIA made several representations at the League in an effort to seek the decolonizing of all Germany's African colonies, which were taken away from her by the victorious Allied nations after World War I. Garvey sought through the UNIA to have the African colonies handed over to black independent rule. The first attempt by the UNIA to lobby for the decolonization of these colonies was made in 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference. This was followed by other representations to the League in 1922, 23, 28, and 1931. On the two latter occasions, Garvey himself put forward the views of the UNIA, but unfortunately the League of Nations never accepted his proposals. Attempted assassination. Sometime in October 1919, a man named George Taylor walked into the UNIA office seeking to meet Marcus Garvey. When Marcus appeared and they began conversing, the man pulled out a pistol and fired four shots, two of which hit Garvey, one in his head and the other in the leg. Garvey was rushed to the Harlem Hospital where he was treated for minor injuries and discharged. His would-be assassin was imprisoned, but died in jail under strange circumstances before the court could have known why he attempted to take the life of the great philosopher. Marcus's Marriage, Divorce, and Marriage Garvey's first marriage was to a young Jamaican girl, Amy Ashwood, who was a UNIA activist. He married her on December 25, 1919, in Liberty Hall, Harlem. Garvey's first association with young Amy Ashwood began in Jamaica, in 1914. However, their marriage did not last too long. It came to an end less than 22 months after their wedding. On divorcing Amy Ashwood in June 1922, while she was away in England, he married another UNIA woman activist, also named Amy, Amy Jacquis, in July 1922. This latter marriage to Amy Jacquis lasted until Marcus departed this life in 1940. Star Line's Bankruptcy In 1923, the Black Star Line was forced into bankruptcy mainly because there was a lack of proper managerial skills along with a high degree of dishonesty by both black and white employees. It was said that those persons who were assigned the responsibility to negotiate for the fleet of ships defrauded the company of thousands of dollars. In addition, 
the white officers quietly sabotaged the line's operation by deliberately wrecking the ship's engines, therefore causing thousands of dollars to be spent on unnecessary repairs. Garvey and Liberia Soon before emancipation of slavery in the United States of America, Liberia was established as an African colony in 1820. It was set up as an area mainly for African American ex-slaves who wanted to resettle in their native African homeland after they had obtained emancipation. In 1920, the UNIA attempted to establish a black colony in Liberia. This was intended to facilitate all Africans living in the Americas, Europe, and the Caribbean who were interested in migrating to Africa. The move to reestablish a link with Liberia came to a halt in 1924, soon after a high-powered UNIA delegation made an official visit to that country. The government of Liberia put a stop to the UNIA plans, although a UNIA sawmill, along with other costly equipment, were on the way to Liberia. As a result of this abrupt halt to the UNIA plans to establish links with Liberia, thousands of dollars were again lost by this organization. Garvey imprisoned in 1923, the federal court in the USA imprisoned Garvey for mail fraud and tax evasion. He was sentenced to five years at the Atlanta State Prisons by Judge Julian Mack. He eventually obtained bail, but he began his jail sentence in 1925. Garvey freed. In November 1927, Garvey's prison term was commuted by President Calvin Coolidge. On his release from prison, Garvey was immediately deported to Jamaica via Panama. From Panama, Garvey, or the Black Messiah, as he was sometimes called by his followers, arranged to return to his native Jamaica, where he revived the UNIA. Marcus Garvey, the poet. You and Me, October 1927, taken from the Negro world. When we think of all the great care that made life's burden great, we long for the passing year to close our sad book of fate. But if we could stop a while and think once the other way, Life would be just all a smile, and we go on day by day. We should never make a day night, for to darken life's good view, round that turning is light that shines as a guide to you. Think of all that's really good, then make it your daily rule. Smile with nature's brotherhood, and none make your footstool. A proverb for every day. And one more for each night shall make life so pleasant, yea, will lead us to live all right. Turn not from sane rectitude, but make life just like a song. Go ye not with the multitude to any path that's wholly wrong. Garvey, forerunner of Emperor Selassie of Ethiopia. One Sunday in 1927, Marcus Garvey prophesied in one of his sermons, Look to Africa, where a black king shall be crowned, for the day of deliverance is here. And when, on November 2, 1930, Rastafari Makonan, also known to the world as Emperor Selassie I, was crowned the 225th monarch of Ethiopia, in a lineage which some historians traced to the union of the Queen Makata of Sheba and Solomon, most black Jamaicans claimed that Garvey was indeed some kind of modern-day apostle or prophet. 
European tour. Garvey and his wife Amy traveled to Europe, Canada, and the Bahamas on an extensive lecture tour in 1928. On this tour, he came in contact with a young African student studying in London, Jomo Kenyatta. Kenyatta later became the first president of independent Kenya. The Black Man Newspaper In early 1929, Marcus started another newspaper which he called The Black Man. The Black Man became the mouthpiece of all black men and women in and out of Jamaica. The Formation of Garvey's Political Party Soon after the UNIA's 6th International Convention, which lasted from August 1st to August 31st, 1929, Marcus Garvey launched the first modern political party in the history of the British Caribbean. The name of Garvey's party was the People's Political Party, PPP. The PPP was formed in time to participate in the Legislative Council election which was scheduled for late January 1930. Garvey charged and imprisoned. In September 1929, during his election campaign, Garvey was charged for gross contempt. Garvey was brought before the Jamaica court where the judges sentenced him to three months in the St. Catherine District Prison along with a fine of 100 pounds. This sentence put a halt to his legislative council campaign. This prison term didn't deter or silence Marcus. He eventually took part in another set of elections, i.e. the Kingston and St. Andrews Corporation, KSAC, council elections, which was soon due. Garvey entered this election as a candidate while campaigning from inside prison. He won the seat for Ward number 3. On release from prison, he attended three meetings of the KSAC Council. Some of the members of the council attempted to unseat him on a technicality that he had missed three consecutive meetings of the council while he was imprisoned. The seat was declared vacant and a by-election held. Marcus eventually re-won the seat unopposed. The K. SAC was eventually closed down by the colonial authorities in September 1930, and when they reopened it in 1931, Marcus remained as a member of that council. While serving as a KSAC council member, Garvey also fought a bitter struggle for the acceptance of an eight-hour day and a minimum wage for all council workers. This battle was never won. The 1934 Convention In 1934, the UNIA held its seventh international convention. At this convention, the UNI delegates present agreed with a proposed five-year plan of the UNIA to reorganize itself. In addition, the convention also sanctioned the idea for Marcus Garvey to move his operations to London. It was generally agreed by delegates that if Garvey was made to operate from a major world capital, the problems of bringing together the fragments of the UNIA should be solved easier. Garvey's Departure to London Marcus Mosiah Garvey left Kingston, Jamaica for the United Kingdom in April 1935 for the last time. He never again put his foot on Jamaican soil. Last UNIA Convention In August 1938, the UNIA, under Marcus Garvey, held its eighth and final convention in Toronto, Canada. Final Caribbean Tour 
Sometime in 1937, Garvey visited a series of Caribbean islands. Among them were Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Barbados, and Antigua. But his ship did not stop at Kingston, Jamaica. It was said that everywhere he stopped, he had large cheerful crowds gathering around to hear his messages and speeches. In Trinidad, the authorities attempted to debar him from entering the island, but because of Deputy Mayor Captain Arthur Cipriani, who came to his assistance, he was eventually given permission to land. Garvey departed. On June 10, 1940, the man, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, died from a stroke in England without ever setting foot on the African continent. When Garvey died, he was approaching his 53rd birthday. Garvey Proclaimed In 1964, Garvey was proclaimed a national hero of Jamaica, therefore becoming Jamaica's first national hero. Garvey responsible for two movements. Out of the doctrine and black nationalist philosophy of Marcus Mosiah Garvey, two famous movements developed in the Western world. One, the black Muslim, i.e. the Nation of Islam, emerged during the late 1930s in the United States of America, led by a former corporal of the UNIA, Elijah Muhammad, and two, the Rastafari movement, developed in Jamaica around the time of the coronation of Emperor Tafari, Selassie I. The Rastafari movement has now grown in large proportions to include every island in the Caribbean, Europe, the Americas, and the African continent. Therefore, Garvey lives in these movements. Excerpts from Garvey's Farewell Address In 1925, after being sentenced to serve five years in the Atlanta State Prison, Garvey wrote to his followers, If I die in Atlanta, my work shall then only begin, but I shall live in the physical or spiritual to see the day of Africa's glory. When I am dead, wrap the mantle of the red, black, and green around me, for in the new life I shall rise with God's grace and blessing to lead the millions up the heights of triumph with the colors that you well know. Look for me in the whirlwind or the storm. Look for me all around you, for with God's grace I shall come and bring with me countless millions of black slaves who have died in America and the West Indies and the millions in Africa to aid you in the fight for liberty, freedom, and life. Marcus Mosiah Garvey, Pan-African Giant The philosophy and opinions of Marcus Mosiah Garvey have been analyzed in great depth by many writers and historians, both past and present. However, many analysts of the Garvey movement have looked upon it mainly from the viewpoint that one of his greatest achievements was the organizing of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which he founded in 1914. But many historians and writers have failed to see that one of his greatest accomplishments, besides organizing the large masses of Africans throughout the world into one organization, or the publishing of literature in the form of the black man or the nation newspapers, was the creation of the Black Star Line Steamship Company. Now, I am not indicating or advocating that any of Garvey's achievements in bringing the African race together was superior to any other, though it must be observed that so often we hear the critics saying or writing that the UNIA Black Star Line Steamship Company was a complete failure. It was the financial bankruptcy of this company which caused the United States government 
after continued instigation from intellectuals such as Dr. Du Bois that led up to Garvey's arrest in 1923 for mail fraud in the USA and to his eventual deportation in 1927 from that country. If Garvey's Black Star Line expedition failed, it did so because the might of America was against it succeeding. The United States government went as far as to communicate with the government of Liberia, with whom they knew officials of the UNIA had been in contact. The United States government informed the Liberian government that they should abandon any sort of assistance or trade arrangements with Garvey's movement. In addition, at that time there were not many African pilots trained in sea navigation. Therefore, the Black Star Line had to rely heavily on recruiting European trained officers to direct the company's fleet of ships. It is now obvious that sabotage was inevitable by both African traders who were employed along with the white members of the staff. The main aim of the Black Star Line Company was to put in practice the very crucial slogan of the UNIA, Africa for the Africans, those home, those abroad. Indeed, such a statement by Garvey in the 1920s would have surely put fear into the hearts of the European ruling class, because its implementation meant that if all or most of the Africans who were transplanted or born in the West decided to leave the colonies, the colonies would be meaningless and capitalism would be useless. This was due to the fact that a large section of the laboring or downpressed peoples who comprised the population in the Caribbean, America, or even Europe were of African origin. The result of an exodus being implemented meant no labor force to man the capitalist factories and the industries in the USA or to work on the docks or waterfronts in the Caribbean, Liverpool, and other ports in Britain. Even today, Africa for Africans should still have deep and consequential meaning. That is why, though Garvey was not a formally educated person by way of university training, he remains the greatest organizer of the African race in the 20th century and probably for centuries to follow. Garvey was a pan-African giant and he knew that a people without a land base and knowledge of themselves are a lost people. That is why he emphasized no man should give up a continent for an island. And he declared just as a tree without roots is dead, so a people without history and cultural roots becomes a dead people. As Africans living in the Western world, it is very important to remember that Africa is all that we have. That is why we must defend it and fight for its total freedom and unification under a just and equitable political and social system where there would not exist any form of exploitation of man by man. During the 1920s, Marcus Garvey was able to sell millions of shares in the Black Star Line. Many of our parents and grandparents were willing to make the sacrifice in order to forward home to Africa, for shadow slavery had only come to an end in the English-speaking Caribbean less than a century or so and Garvey was well aware of the plight of our people in that period. Many Africans, i.e. both men and women, were still suffering from inferior superior complexes which were institutionalized by slavery. Furthermore, although slavery was said to be abolished in 1834 in the British Caribbean and 1865 in the United States, not many African folks were privileged to be educated. In the period after slavery, education was a privilege, mainly for the planter and ruling classes. The bulk 
of the African population were involved in trades as artisans, working as carpenters, plumbers, masons, tailors, etc. It was only a few like Dr. W. E. B. Du Bois who were able to make it to university level. It is not surprising that those intellectuals such as Du Bois were the ones who misunderstood Garvey and misinterpreted what he preached. However, in the new development of Pan-Africanism as a concept and philosophy to scientifically guide our people, Garveyism, its ideas and opinions must be acknowledged, because if there were no Marcus Garvey, then there would not have been an Elijah Muhammad or a Nation of Islam, and there would not have been a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a Malcolm X, or a Kwame Torre, i.e. Stokely Carmichael, to expound on black power and pan-Africanism. If there were no Garvey, who would have been the forerunner to the Rastafari movement? The man Marcus Mosiah Garvey was and still is a fine and exemplary African man who lived and would continue to live for the development and unification of all Africa and her peoples. Garvey knew that unless our people became organized into an international organization with a land base on the continent of Africa, we as a people would not obtain and command any respect. In his role as organizer, he proved to be a general on the field, creating organ after organ, i.e. from the nation to the black man newspapers, to ensure that our peoples, wherever they resided, received the message, so that they could renew their dignity and self-pride, in order that one day we might eventually rise up from our deep sleep slumber and help free Africa's children. Therefore, as a profound leader, one can say without any doubts that Marcus Mosiah Garvey is the father of modern-day Pan-Africanism. Quotable Quotations from Marcus Mosiah Garvey There is nothing in the world common to man that man cannot do. The ends you serve that are selfish will take you no further than yourself, but the ends you serve that are for all in common will take you even into eternity. Admiration is a form of appreciation that is sometimes mistaken for something else. There may be something about you that suggests good fellowship when kept at a distance, but in closer contact would not be tolerated, otherwise it'd be love. Wake up Ethiopia, wake up Africa, let us work toward the one glorious end of a free, redeemed, and mighty nation. Let Africa be a bright star among the constellation of nations. This is the day of racial activity, when each and every group of this great human family must exercise its own initiative and influence in its own protection. Therefore, Africans should be more determined today than they have ever been because the mighty forces of the world are operating against non-organized groups of people who are not ambitious enough to protect their own interests. A man's bread and butter is only insured when he works for it. The only protection against injustice in man is power, physical, financial, and scientific. The masses make the nation and the race. If the masses are illiterate, that is the judgment passed on the race by those who are critical of its existence. Education is the medium by which a people are prepared for the creation of their own particular civilization and the advancement and glory of their own race. Nationhood is the only means by which modern civilization can completely protect itself. Nationhood is the highest ideal of all peoples. Let Africa be our guiding star, our star of destiny. 
So many of us find excuses to get out of the African race because we are led to believe that the race is unworthy, that it has not accomplished anything. Cowards that we are. It is we who are unworthy because we are not contributing to the uplift and upbuilding of this noble race. Be as proud of your race today as our fathers were in the days of yore. We have a beautiful history and we shall create another in the future that will astonish the world. Woman What the night is to the day is woman to man. The period of change that brings us light out of darkness, darkness out of light, and semi-light out of darkness are like the changes we find in women day to day. She makes one happy, then miserable. You are the kind, then unkind, constant, yet inconstant. Thus we have woman. No real man can do without her. Peoples everywhere are traveling toward industrial opportunities and greater political freedom. As a race oppressed, it is for us to prepare ourselves that at any time the great change in industrial freedom and political liberty comes about. We may be able to enter into the new era as partakers of the joys to be inherited. All peoples are struggling to blast their way through the industrial monopoly of races and nations, but the African as a whole has failed to grasp its true significance and seems to delight in filling only that place created for him by the white man. No race in the world is so just as to give others for the asking a square deal in things economic, political, and social. Men who are in earnest are not afraid of consequences. No one knows when the hour of Africa's redemption cometh. It is in the wind. It is coming. One day like a storm it will be here. When that day comes all Africa will stand together. Any sane man, race or nation that desires freedom must first of all think in terms of blood. Why? Even the Heavenly Father tells us that Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. Then how in the name of God, with history before us, do we expect to redeem Africa without preparing ourselves, some of us, to die? Every man has a right to his own opinion. Every race has a right to its own action. Therefore, let no man persuade you against your will. Let no other race influence you against your own. The greatest weapon used against Africa is disorganization. If you have no confidence in self, you are twice defeated in the race of life. With confidence, you have won even before you have started. At no time within the last 500 years can one point to a single instance of the African as a race of haters. The African has loved even under severest punishment. In slavery, the African loved his master. He safeguarded his home even when he further planned to enslave him. We are not a race of haters, but lovers of humanity's cause. There can be no peace among men and nations so long as the strong continues to oppress the weak, so long as injustice is done to other peoples, just so long Will we have cause for war and make a lasting peace an impossibility? Hungry men have no respect for law, authority, or life. The battles of the future, whether they be physical or mental, will be fought on scientific lines in the race that is able to produce the highest scientific development is the race that will ultimately rule. Let us prepare today for the tomorrow and the lives of the nations will be so eventful that Africans everywhere will be called upon to play their part in the survival of the fittest human group. Day by day we hear the cry of Africa for the Africans. The cry has become a positive determined one. It is a cry that is raised simultaneously the world over because of the universal oppression that affects the African. 
We want to see the black man highly developed, seeking to discover the hidden forces in nature, harnessing them to his will for the good of all. Important Dates of Historical Events 1776 The American Revolution 1789 The French Revolution 1791 The Haitian Revolution Haiti became the first black republic August 1st 1834 Emancipation of Africans enslaved in the Caribbean 1840 Marxist socialist ideology awakens Europe 1845 Start of East Indian indentureship. 1865. Slavery abolished in the USA. August 17, 1887. Birth of Marcus Mosiah Garfi, St. Anne's, Jamaica. July 23, 1889. Birth of Ras Dafari, Emperor Haile Selassie in Ethiopia. 1899. Tobago was made a ward of Trinidad. 1914, World War I starts. 1919, Waterfront Riots, Trinidad. 1925, Limited Adult Franchise Granted to the People of Trinidad and Tobago. November 2nd, 1930, The Coronation of the 225th and Final Emperor to the Ethiopian Throne, Emperor Haile Selassie I. 1937, Labor unrest in the T&T oil fields, led by Tubal Uriah Buzz Butler. 1939, World War II commences. 1940, Marcus Garvey died in England. 1945, end of World War II. 1946, full adult franchise granted to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. 1950, the Butler Party is the first party to contest Trinidad and Tobago elections. 1956, People's National Movement, PNM, became the first party government in Trinidad and Tobago. 1958, Federation was formed among ten British colonies in the Caribbean. The capital was Trinidad. 1959, the Cuban Revolution led by Dr. Fidel Castro. 1961, Federation was dissolved. August 6, 1962, Jamaica became independent. August 31, 1962, Trinidad and Tobago become independent. May 24, 1963, Organization of African Unity, OAU, formed. May 26, 1966, Guyana achieved independence. 1968, C-A-R-I-F-T-A, CARIFTA was formed. February 1970, social and political unrest in Trinidad and Tobago, led by the National Joint Action Committee. 1973, C-A-R-I-C-O-M, CARICOM was formed. CARIFTA dissolved. September 13, 1973, Beverly Jones of the National United Freedom Fighters was killed by a combined police army unit in Trinidad. September 24, 1976, Trinidad and Tobago became a republic within the Commonwealth. March 13, 1979, the New Jewel Movement, led by Maurice Bishop, seized political power in Grenada. It was the first overthrow in the English-speaking Caribbean. March 29, 1981, the death of the first Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Eric Eustace Williams. October 19, 1983, Maurice Bishop, popular Prime Minister of the People's Revolutionary Government, PRG, was assassinated in Fort Rupert, St. George, Grenada. October 25th, 1983, U.S. President Ronald Reagan instructs U.S. Marines and other Caribbean military forces to invade the 90-square-mile island of Grenada.
Raps O Farewell and Ode for Garvey Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey Freedom fighter and friend Lover of African peoples to your very end I can see you Garvey The black star liner is sailing I hear your voice rumbling, rumbling in the whirlwind Your message is spreading, manifesting in Rastafari Echoing black power Black power beyond the Carib Sea and Blue Mountain region, from St. Anne's, Jamaica, Harlem, and Brixton, East Dry River to Trench Town. Oh, Garvey, oh, Garvey, I hear you saying, Africa for all Africans. Remember your pride and liberty. Oh, Garvey, oh, Garvey, we bid you farewell. Lead us in this struggle. Oh, gosh, to the very end. Seiko Tafari End of From the Maroons to Marcus A Historical Development by Seiko Tafari